welcome everyone to the Newburyport Literary Festival. My name is Jennifer Entwistle and I am the co-director of the festival and it is my honor to introduce Catherine Osler. She's been editor-in-chief of Tatler, editor of ES Magazine at the Evening Standard, the editor of the Times Weekend. <clears throat> She's a graduate of Oxford University where she read English, specializing in 18th century literature. Uh, the Duchess Countess is her first book, and she's joining us from England. And joining her in conversation is Suzanne Leopold. She's the creator of SusieApproved.com, which is her website for sharing book reviews. She's also the founder of SusieApprovedBookTours.com, where she aggregates her community of bloggers across social media platforms to support authors with their book launches. So Susie and Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, what a pleasure. So I'm so excited to be chatting with you about your book, The Duchess Countess. You know, it's a, it reads like, it's a historical biography, but it reads like a novel. And my first question to you is, what made you decide to write about Elizabeth? The book is about Elizabeth Chudley. What made you decide to write about her? Okay, several things, but one of them you've already hit on the head, which is that I, I wanted to write history, but her story to me read like a novel. And having been an English graduate and loving sort of reading stories, I was just so amazed that it was true. And I wanted to sort of investigate what it all kind of meant and put it into context. So I first came across her in a book by Simon Seabag Montefiore called um, Catherine the Great and Potemkin. And he was describing this scene in 18th century Russia where this yacht suddenly arrived in St. Petersburg with this sort of duchess on board from England. And she had all these sort of animals and an orchestra and these paintings. And she started throwing this, these sort of crazy parties and trying to get everybody on board. And he wrote, she wasn't really a duchess. She was a sort of criminal who'd fled London. And I was reading this story and I think, why haven't I heard of this woman? This story is completely sort of bonkers. And I also, as Jen mentioned, I had studied early 18th century literature and I was very kind of fond of that period, which was the beginning of British newspapers as well, where they sort of, and the creation of celebrity really, um, where the more newspapers were printed, the more gossip started and people like Alexander Pope and Addison were sort of writing catty poems and fo founding pamphlets and sort of magazines. And I, I just sort of loved the period and I loved the idea of this crazy woman. So I went down this sort of rabbit hole of researching her. By the end, I knew so much about it. I had to write a book to justify my reading. <laughs> It was amazing. I mean, I found her life fascinating, her, the struggles she went through in her life, but then the, the ability to recreate herself, the people she touched, and, and given that there were so many restrictions on women, this was not like what we, when we watched Bridgerton, this is not Bridgerton. What's your, what was your feeling on that as you were, you know, as you read about her? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. So, what we all know by this point is that women in history occupy this strange place. It's sort of, if they're not actually a sort of monarch or incredibly famous, it's quite hard to research them because the records, you know, be it property ownership or legal documents, they're mostly sort of about men. But, and women like Elizabeth tend to be thoroughly um, othered, for want of a better word. So she became known as this sort of outrageous bigamist, which she sort of was partly, but the challenge for the modern historian is what would it have been like to be that person then? So as much as I read all these sort of startling facts about her life, I wanted to put it into the context of, as you say, this sort of terrible sort of suffocating entrapment the women felt where, mm -hmm. you know, they're not educated. They can't, even if they are, they're their options are extremely limited. They can't go into sort of law or medicine or politics or anything, um, obviously. So their choice is if they are working class, they can go into service. If they're upper class, maybe they can live off relations if they have them. But basically, beyond a certain point, they've just got to get married. And if they don't find anyone to marry, they really, you know, their survival is at stake. So 
you get some of that desperation in Bridgerton, but she was in that awkward spot that we know from Jane Austen where you're kind of genteel, the expectations are there, but it's actually not backed up by any cash. There isn't any money, there's no dowry. So she did find through connections, the one thing that she could do, which was get a role at court as maid of honor to the then princess of Wales. Um, and, and, and she got that through connections and that came with an income, but that led to all sorts of problems. Um, as you would have read, because that was a job you could only hold if you were unmarried, so. So what was the re, I mean, this is a time period, yeah. this is from a long time ago. So the research, how did you obtain the information on Elizabeth? I mean, how did you, how did you find this, the documentation from her? Well, yes, it, it, so the funny, so this is sort of mid 18th century. So she's born just to get it sort of into context for everybody. She was born in 1721 and she died in 1788 in Paris just before the French Revolution. So, you know, it's a long time ago. It's the sort of in, bang in the middle of the long 18th century, as it were. Now, luckily there were two things really. One is lots of surviving letters. She became quite famous quite early in life because if you were a maid of honour, it was sort of gazetted, it was announced in the press. So in her early 20s, she was being written about. So the fortunate effect of um, this is that people tended to keep letters from her because she was a known person, right? And those are the letters that get kept, unless you're very lucky and people just, you find a hoarder or something. So lots of other people had kept letters from her, sort of jewellers, friends, neighbours and most of those were in sort of they were all over the place actually they were in Nottingham University and various places like that when she came to have her bigamy trial in 1776 at the height of the war of independence which is something I'm, we might get onto later but there was an enormous amount of newspaper coverage and later on she bought lots of property in Europe so the joy of the internet is I found amazing things like the records of all her property transactions in Estonia, oh. which I could then put in Google Translate, something that would have been completely impossible even 10 years ago, you know, <laughs> and incredible. So all over the place is the answer, but it's patchy. If it's that long ago, you know, there'll be sort of 10 years of her life when you don't find anything, say, and then you've got to come at it from other angles. Who's written diaries about her? Where did she, it, so all sorts of things, sort of local poor tax, um, many different sources, church records, um, but you know, I, I love research, I have to say, it takes you down, you know, you never know where you're going to end up, but it, it's, it's never even, that's the thing, you end up with sort of piles and piles of stuff on one year of a 60 year life, you know. So when I Googled her, I find yeah. out about her outfit. And that's in the book about the, out, you know, she was notorious for wearing something very see-through, you know, back then, you know. Yes, yes. I was like, yeah, this poor woman, that's, you know, scandalous back then. Yes, she was properly scandalous. So she went to a party and she was sort of attention seeking and you, it, it was a masquerade and you could dress as somebody from Greek myth. And she went as Iphigenia ready for the sacrifice, but she chose deliberately. She was a theatrical character. I think if she'd been born in a different setting, she would have been an actress really. Um, and she, was she, it was sort of like a sort of Lady Gaga Kardashian thing. It was basically, <laughs> what, so as a, you know, we've got the Met Ball coming up, haven't we? It was one of those, it was a naked dress really. To, if you looked at her across the room, she looked completely naked. And it, it was so disgusting. I can't quite work out whether it was just flesh colored or whether it was actually see-through, but she stopped everyone in their tracks. And a hundred years later, people were still buying engravings of this outfit in London. So crazy. Yeah, crazy. It, it was great to read about. So when I was reading the book, I was just amazed about the information covered in her life because it read like a novel to me. So I kept yeah. thinking about you and, you know, what was the, how do you put this book together? What, 
what are some of the hurdles and especially, I mean, this is like a few questions at once. How yeah. long did this take to write? And well, it, you know, you know I, I'm, I'm ashamed to say it took me a heck of a long time, right? So I started sort of reading about it and then I got so obsessed, I wanted to get everything. I also wanted to do, apart from physically getting hold of all these letters and things, lots of things could be emailed, but then lots of, you know, libraries and various places I had to go to. Amazing resources, you know, sort of, a credible kind of Walpole Library at Yale and you know people are archivists are a breed apart they're so helpful but then there was all the sort of optical research or the visual research or whatever we called it where I sort of got slightly obsessed with wanting to go everywhere she'd lived and bought which the chapel outside Winchester where she had her first marriage which is now a ruin in the grounds of her hotel and the place where it all started which is by the river in Chelsea, which is the Royal Hospital, which you can still go round actually, well, like, which I really recommend to anyone who comes to London. It's the most sort of beautiful kind of 17th century Christopher Wren palace that housed and still houses old soldiers by the river. And her father was the Lieutenant Governor. So that's where she spent the five, first five years of her life. But given what's happened now, I was very lucky with the timing actually, because I finished it just before lockdown and the last trip I did was to St Petersburg um, because she'd spent so much time in Russia and the Hermitage mm -hmm. happened to be having an exhibition which was a coincidence but they had they had an exhibition of things that Potemkin, Catherine the Great's partner um, had owned and lots of them had come from her so I managed to see that just as I finished the book of course it's impossible now but um, right. Yeah, so it, it took me all over the place. I just... Yeah, I love that. I was I love that because I've been to England and some of the some of the I was like, wow, really? You know, like it was like back in time. It was great to just go back and current. So I appreciated yeah. that. It, you know, another thing that I was thinking about was the editing. You know, you want to make sure everything's factual. Like, what was the editing process like? And was there anybody in particular who was very helpful to that process for you? Because I just it's just a well it is just a wealth of you know not for me it was like a wealth of knowledge I just was I loved it so how did you get you know, how do you get it right and make sure the editor you know how did how long did that take in itself that's a whole okay, well I have some I had some very wise friends who write and one of them said writing is rewriting and and they gave me this great sort of tip that writers love I'm sure we've had this before which is read it out to yourself and then you know whether it's working or not. So I went over it and over it and over it again, because as you say, it, it, you know, the problem is when you're doing an amount of research is it's all interesting to you and you, you don't want to sort of kill any of it. But um, I had a very tough husband who's now, he's now a businessman, but he used to be a literary editor and he put mean red lines through things saying I'm losing the will to live in this bit and I sort of obviously hated him and was eventually grateful but I also had a brilliant editor at Simon and Schuster who who's called Ian Marshall and he was he was very good on the sort of he was very good on structure as well I, I you know it was difficult it was extremely interesting um it, it, it was such a complicated life. You know, there are many ways of writing a life. In her case, I thought it has, this has to be broadly chronological, although there was an introduction about the trial. Otherwise it'll just be too confusing. But I, I played with all sorts of ideas in my head. Shall I start with the trial and go backwards so we can see what's true? I kept imagining it as a movie. You know, you, you, it, it, it's, it's, there's so much choice involved. Um, you're right. but. In the end, I think you just write it to the point when you just want to stop. You don't really believe it can be any better and people can agree or disagree, but you, you're just sort of done with it. And that's where I got to, but. Yeah, I, I kept thinking also <laughs> like with all, with all the flavor of like all the books about this time period in movies, do you see an opportunity for this to go on screen? Because it would be, I mean, it would be great. It would be just unbelievable. Oh, I'm glad you think so. It is under discussion actually. There is, it's being negotiated at the moment. Of course, I agree. <laughs> I, no, no, I just, I just, yeah. As a reader, I love when you find somebody who I didn't know about and then 
that time period and we've come a long way but we haven't come a long way i mean women couldn't own land it was just like what you know, like just yeah. if you're not i i didn't really under, you know just to see who the haves and the have nots and the places in society it just was a really it was an eye opener for me and as yeah. a reader it just you know i i appreciated that so oh, you God. this is your this is your first book. What yeah. was that like switching gears? And you also have, how was that managing a job and then a debut novelist? What was that experience well, like for you? One of the first two years, so as I say, it took me, I mean, it, it, it slightly got put back because of the pandemic, but it basically took me three years. The first two years, I was sort of writing newspaper features and things at the same time, but then I stopped. I thought I will never get to the end of this thing unless I, so I stopped. So I, then I stopped and sort of wrote it. Um, and then now I am doing another one. It was a two book deal, which is, it's another female story. This time it's about Femme de Seac of France, actually. Um, so, yeah, I think combining two things, some people do it very successfully. And I do, you know, sort of written your piece about it in your book review, but I find it rather challenging, I have to admit. I'm a bit, you're either. You know, I think the ideal for a book, particularly if you're trying to describe an age, is total immersion in that period. You know, you don't want to distract yourself by thinking about other things. You just kind of pop the bubble and then you can't, you know, uh, particularly right. as I, I like the sort of history where you can taste it and you can smell it and what's everybody wearing and is there fried food in the air and what's the music over there and do the stairs creak and who's painting whose picture and why is X? not married yet and have the navy arrived and is there a threat of war you know and how many candles are lit in the corner that's what <laughs> i love you know so i i want to be able to try and take the reader into the room so it, it, that's the sort of you can't really do that unless you're sort of fully involved with it yeah and you did that with the book i mean the perspective that the men you know men can the men could do whatever they wanted but for the women there was a totally different rule and yeah. she just yes yeah, she persevered she you know she didn't give up really but i mean she was sad sometimes but she didn't give up she just kept going you know yeah no she wasn't really having any of it well her father died young and then her brother died young and then it was just right. her and one of the sort of mysteries of of non-fiction is sometimes you get a character and you don't really know what's happened to them so like her mother her mother He's sort of there, she eventually gets her a job through the king as housekeeper of Windsor Castle. But it, there are no letters, she never mentions her. So there's this, sort of, you're left with this question mark, what happens? So you start imagining things. This woman had lost her husband and her son. Maybe she never got over it. Maybe she was depressed, but you just don't quite, you know, know. So there are things that you, there are challenges to this. There are things you can just never know, you know, and you can speculate. A bit but you can't get too carried away with speculation otherwise you're just writing you know <laughs> well, i want to see it on yeah. you know yeah. i want to see it on screen because i just i found it, it i found it fascinating that was oh, back, especially back then for that period because women just had a place and had a role and she just she was crashed through know. it yeah right right and I love the end with the your the end of the you had the photos and some of your commentary was just like I loved it. It just kind of pulled it all together, which I appreciated as a reader. Oh, good, good. Oh, no, I yeah. so she was a proper outlier. I mean, one of the things that I did want to do because that period is so decorative. I mean, we were talking earlier about you know some of the 18th century houses in Virginia and you know Bridgerton and Jane Austen, and we associate it rightly with such beauty, you know, it's all still the fashions, the architecture, the colors, the paintings, it's all sort of exquisite. But one of the things I wanted to describe is this terrible, you know, this atmosphere for women, which was so restrictive. You know, they really were kind of in invisible chains for all they're wearing their glorious pastel chiffon, if they're that lucky, yeah. you know. So, um, there's so for an 18th century woman you know yeah she was i pre, i love outliers and for that time period she is like yeah. you know, go girl you know <laughs> yeah. i so before i wrap up i wanted to ask you is there you know something that you wanted to what are you reading what are you watching this you know just as um, you as a person 
Okay, me as a person. So what I'm reading, it's that, well, because I'm I'm actually, it sounds so pretentious, but I'm reading Proust because I'm writing about that period in France okay. at the moment. And I'm so I'm sort of reading that and I'm also reading various sort of letters and diaries about the end of 19th century France. And my next book, it's based, it begins with a Renoir painting, actually. So the Impressionists, you know, I'm reading a lot of stuff from that period, but at the moment I'm reading um, the second volume of Remembrance of Things Past, which obviously I'm enjoying enormously, okay. but I'm calling it research. Slightly. <laughs> <laughs> when can we expect that book? Is there... Well, I've got to finish it by the end of the year, so it should come out next year, I think, end of oh, next year. End of end of next year. Yeah, it's it's an it's um it's a very uh it's a sort of different story in some ways and then in others because it's about women's lives. It, it is it is again it's about the restrictions and the challenges of them. It takes them through nineteenth century France, the end of it up until the Second World War. Um, Great. Yeah. I look forward to it. So before we wrap up, I'd like to yeah. um, have you just let readers know where they can find you on social media, if you have a newsletter. So if you want to give some of those, you know, oh, okay. where, well, where I, can they find you? Yeah. Twitter, Catherine Osler and Instagram, C E Osler. And I have, I've got a website as well. If anyone, you know, wants to send messages or anything, which is just catherineosler.com. So. Yeah, it was wonderful interviewing you. And before I wrap up, I wanted to say, you know, grab the book. It's Independent Bookstore Day. But please make sure to support the authors leaving five-star reviews <laughs> on Amazon, Goodreads, BookBub. You know, if you're in a diner, you want to leave it on the bathroom wall, just, you know, go ahead. And <laughs> it was a wonderful, <laughs> it was a wonderful story. Um, and, you know, I, I want to see it on the screen, you know. So it was wonderful interviewing you. I appreciate, you know, your time here in England. So oh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Such fun to talk to you. Um, thank you, Susie and Catherine, for that great discussion. Um, I want to remind people that we are going to do some Q&A. So if you have a question for Catherine um, or for Susie, you can ask Susie a question too, I suppose. <laughs> um, but please put it in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we do have a question for Catherine here um, from Raphael. Um, how differently do you use and treat official sources like newspaper articles, legal documents, et cetera, and primary sources like personal letters or diaries. What are the opportunities and risks with both of these? Um, okay, that's a very interesting question. I think um, legal documents, well, legal documents are funny. There's a period in, it's a very tortuous period in England where lawyers are paid per word. Okay, so they go on and on and on, particularly wills where they start listing and then if this person dies and then that person dies and you think I will never get to the end of this thing. But, you know, they generally, they are what they are. Newspaper reports, I'm afraid, aren't reliable at all. I mean, they're reliable in that that's what the journalists wrote, but the 18th century British press was terribly corrupt. So um, I had the joy of finding the bank account of Elizabeth Chudley um, when she was married to her second husband. And there were payments to, uh, it, it, she, it, she basically hired a succession of publicists. We all think we invented PR, we didn't at all. So, and they were usually clergymen because they were very literate and they were well, ed well educated, but they didn't have very much money. So she would hire them as sort of freelance PR people and they would place stories in newspapers for her. So for example, when it came to her trial, the newspapers completely disagreed about who was winning and who was presenting the better case because both sides were paying the newspapers. So, I, I, you know, you, you have to sort of patch it all together very carefully because every, everybody had a sort of point of view or, uh, some sort of financial interest at stake, really. And people didn't really worry then about being independent. You know, even as she died, they wrote the story of her life 
there's no sort of footnotes then or anyone checking anything. They just wrote also, even the divide actually between fiction and non-fiction wasn't like it was now. It was sort of they gave they sort of told her life, but they told it in the most entertaining way they possibly could, without, and they were perfectly willing to sacrifice the truth if it meant it made it a better story. So I thought about it a lot, and where I wasn't sure, I had to acknowledge it. And I did a sort of heck of a lot of sort of end notes and things to show, well, this came from here, but we can't be quite sure. And yeah, so it was an interesting process. Um, so we have a question from Casey Davis. Being a modern woman, how do you not become angered or emotional while writing these period pieces about women? Yeah, interesting. Well, I, do, I suppose I do get quite angry and emotional, and certainly I'm incredibly so compassionate and sympathetic. And I think that if you weren't emotionally involved with these women from the past, one couldn't really, you know, have the the energy to imagine walking in their footsteps. I think that is one of the the emotional engagement is something I was sort of aiming for in the reader and something that I was sort of pleased to experience in myself because I think that the challenge of the biographer is not only what happens to a person but it's why does it happen what what are they fighting against and with her she made some very sort of difficult decisions but I did find her story very moving you know terrible very sad and secret things happened to her and so the answer was I didn't, I, I, I did get emotionally involved. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that's sort of particularly, I don't think that's a bad thing. I'm not really, you know, a, a sort of cool customer about it, but, um, you know, obviously one has to stand back and make sure one's not so involved, one's just completely biased, but, you know, equally, I think that, um, books with emotion in it are, you know, are a good thing. My um, you did so much research. What, what, what do you think was the most surprising thing that you discovered? Surprising thing. Um, I, I suppose um, the most surprising thing, I, 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 two things really struck me actually. Um, one was the fact, okay, it, 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 this is a sort of context issue. I was really startled and no one had really written the fact that I sort of knew this trial where 4,000 people come to Westminster Hall to watch this woman being convicted of bigamy. And it was a huge national event. And I'd always known it was during the War of Independence. But what I really, I didn't want to overwrite this in case I got into trouble, but it really did stop the War of Independence. It was the absolute height. The Britain had lost, just lost Boston. And they were writing, the King was overseeing the terms with which the Howe brothers could negotiate with Washington. And this whole process stopped for two weeks because the lawyers who were writing these terms were the same lawyers who were in charge of Elizabeth Chudley's trial. So, and the entire cabinet and the House of Lords was involved and all the British press. So it sort of really isn't an exaggeration to say Britain put the War of Independence on hold so that they could watch one middle-aged aristocrat be humiliated for having been married twice. And that I found completely sort of Fascinating. It's part of the English culture. So we can have war in Ukraine and the Brits will obsess about whether Boris Johnson has had a piece of birthday cake. I'm not, you know, it is a thing in the British psyche I, I, it, that when there's something unbearable happening that nobody agrees on and nobody knows what to do about, they will find something else, something more fun, trivial, whatever to focus on. So I was fascinated by that. And actually, yeah, that was one thing. There were many others. 
Kara <laughs> um, Gleason asks, Elizabeth lived at, at a time of corruption and limits on civil rights, but it was also no. a time of reform movements. Did she get involved in any? Yeah, she did a bit, now it has to be said, she was not a great, I mean, her battle mostly was for her own survival. She wasn't, she was never in a secure enough position to even, apart from there was a brief moment with her second husband where she was happily married, she was never in a secure position legally to embrace other causes. Having said that, and she didn't have any living children, having said that, she was a great believer in female education. And that was something she did try to um, sort of help in her, in her will. Actually, her will, it, it didn't happen, but she tried to set up a school in Calais, where she eventually moved to for a while. Um, and she believed in equal education for men and women. The, the other thing she was interested in on actually, which she was quite far-sighted, people thought this was insane at the time, was she'd had a few friends who got into trouble for debt. And she didn't believe that debtors should be in the same prison as, prisons as uh, sort of hardened criminals. And so she also wanted to leave money for a separate prison in Calais for those who were in debt, which, Sounds ridiculous now that we would even imprison people in, in, in debt, but as we know from our Dickens and things, that, that was a real issue now. So she, she, did, she did have some far-sighted ideas. She certainly, and she, although it, throughout her life, although it was about herself, she was always writing about the plight of women. You know, why, why should women not be able to own property? Why shouldn't they be able to sell it? You know, she had this, uh, farm in Devon and she wanted to sell it and she was sort of haggled over the price and she was very aware that this wasn't seen as feminine behaviour so she would write in her letters you know I know people think this isn't how women should behave but you know I don't see why they should behave any different from men so she had this sort of she was quite aware that her plight wasn't you know, the same as a man's and that angered her. Um, so for anyone who finishes reading your book and they want to stay in this world or in this same, you know, genre, uh, is there any re book recommendations that you would make for, for your oh, next well, read? Um, well, let's think. I, funny enough, I just did a, one of those wonderful things in the Wall Street Journal, which was about, you know, sort of um, books about monarchs. So there are two great books on monarchs at the time. One is Seabag Montefiore's book on Catherine the Great and the other is Andrew Roberts's book on um, George III so they're about the period. If one wants to go to France um, I've got I, I've got a soft spot for Nancy Mitford's Madame de Pompadour, um, Robert Massey, Peter the Great and his Catherine the Great um, and the other thing that's enormous fun it's a bit of a deep dive is Horace Walpole's letters and diaries which is a great resource for any 18th century historian will draw on this because he meets everyone he knows everybody he has a view on everything um, as one of the very good questions mentioned earlier he has to be um, treated with a certain degree of skepticism because he wrote what he wanted to be true half the time rather than what was true but he's enormously entertaining there's a I think it's a, either 2017 or 2019 edition, uh, edited edition of his letters and diaries, which I, I think is enormous fun if, if one's interested in this sort of, you know, the comings and goings of 18th century England. Well, I think everyone is based on the popularity <laughs> of Bridgerton. It's a, have you watched all those shows? I have, I completely have, yes. It's ingenious. <laughs> the treatment of it, I think, is ingenious. Um, I, I, I mean, I suppose one of the things I always long for people to realise is, you know, I think they, they do get it across quite well, is, is this sort of terrible sort of trap that women were in. You know, it is sort of, it shows you the, actually it changed slightly in season two, didn't it? But it, it, it shows you the lighter side. Right. Actually, uh, Kathy Harbour has a, a related question. Uh, 
what do you think made her different as in why can't women be more equal? Uh, sorry, what, what, what made, um, what made uh, Elizabeth different? Why, why okay. do you think made her different? Um, I why think there's a title think... in here, so sorry. Okay, so I think it's sort of, um, why, why did she behave so outrageously? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, interesting. Okay, so I think partly it's circumstance. So she had this rather idyllic life, these very grand relations. She had a lot going in her favor. She was sort of witty and quick witted and she'd been taught French and she'd been taught how to dance and she was very beautiful. So she had a lot stacked in her favor, um, but she had no proper advice. As we discussed earlier, the mother had sort of disappeared and wasn't sort of looking after her. So she made a few sort of silly decisions. Um, I think, you know, I was trying to, she was so outrageous that I consulted a psychiatrist at one point because she did exhibit some very strange behavior. And I said, but what do you think about this? And he said, he thought that possibly she had sort of some kind of borderline personality disorder type thing. I mean, it's impossible to know from, from now, but I think she, was she was completely fearless and I think partly because her father she'd grown up on military stories she'd grown up surrounded by old soldiers and you know Britain the Duke of Marlborough had won these wars and she saw herself as a sort of almost like a sort of female soldier in a way so you know, she she had a very interesting psyche I mean there are many threads about why she became her um if anyone has a question, I think we have time for, for one or two more. So I just want to open that up if anybody wants to get one in here before we wrap up. Anyone, question? Susie, any question that you didn't hit that you uh, wish you had asked during your interview? No, I think we got them all. But yeah, all. yeah, the borderline that came out too, that, you know, maybe modern medicine would have helped her. But yeah, that was. Yes, that was quite controversial. It's a yeah, sort of yeah. new thing now. You look at, funnily enough, I just read a book about this, something that happened in 1820, and the historian, he's a very distinguished Cambridge academic, said, I think the lead guy was bipolar. That's the only way I can understand his behaviour. You know, I like it because I think we're reading about these people. If they behave really oddly, aren't we now going right. to try and work out why it's not a criticism? But it, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it has a question mark. <clears throat> yeah, there was, it was limited back then. You know, it was limited. You were, you, women were limited. Medicine was limited. You didn't live till, you know, you didn't live till, when, you know, 55 was like, I'm 55. You know, you live till that age. Yeah, of, yeah. Well, the, what they would always do was bleed you. So you only had to exhibit the signs of a sort of tiredness and you get a leech stuck on you and your blood would be coming out. And that would, 95% of chance, that would make you feel a heck of a lot worse. Um, so some great questions are coming in here at the end. So this okay. is great. What other women in history interest you and would you like to research more? Oh, well, at the moment, as I mentioned earlier, I am researching these um, women called the Cayenne d'Anvers family. They were painted by Renoir. And um, I like, I yes, lots of women, lots of women connected to art interest me, actually, because I feel there, there, there are m many stories of sort of women that haven't been, and writers, creative women, women who've sort of tried to stand up to society in some way, and have stuck themselves above the parapet, for whatever reason, those are, those are the ones that interest me, really. Um, and here's a great question. Uh, how difficult was it to let Elizabeth go in the end? Um, really hard and I'm not sure that I have. I was tortured the other day. Someone sent me a link to a book about the trial. It was sort of 850 pounds or something uh, at a sort of antiquarian London bookshop. And, the, and I was looking at it thinking, I so want that. Can I really justify? I'm writing about something completely different. You know, I don't think you you get to know someone so well in a way. It, it's it's tough. It, it, it you know it is tough. And also, I do love that period, as I said. So 
I, but I love it. I look at the world, you know, the more you think about things, as we all know from art and architecture, and you look at things through new eyes. So I go into central London, I pass Kingston House opposite Hyde Park. It's now a huge block of flats. It's named after her old house. So you sort of coexist with these things. I don't think you let go of them. Well, and I suppose being on tour and talking about her, you really haven't let her go yet. No. You're, you're still very, very entrenched in it. And I was yeah. thinking as you were talking, I was like, I can't believe how much you can keep in your head still. Um, <laughs> all of these details. Um, but, but yes. The other I thing is, you, you see echoes of it. You know, like the thing I said about how they were thinking about her during the War of Independence. And, you know, they were constantly gossiping about everything. And, you, you know, all the arguments we have about Twitter, you know, should it be anonymous? They had all that then. So I find it very interesting to understand the history of things like gossip and media. And, you know, they had anonymous blind gossip items then, 1720. You know, they'd say, oh, guess which, but, you know, so I find it very interesting, just on a sort of human nature. Right, oh, right. You know. The more things change, the more they stay the same, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for joining us, Catherine and Susie. Um, thank this you. Has been a great conversation. And I could see in the chat, people were saying, I just bought the book. So um, <laughs> thank you for joining us and telling us all about Elizabeth. Um, it was great to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank, for you. Having me. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.